Lissa, and Holly. Hi. Hi. I am so excited to be doing this event with you because your book is so good and I have a lot of questions and I really want to talk about it with you. <laughs> so excited to be here. Thank you everyone so much for coming. Um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> you work events are very exciting because yeah, you're like, fun. hey, why don't we just have a circle? <laughs> we can all talk. Um, so thank you so much for joining me. I love The Cruel Prince. I got to reread it in preparation for this, and it's even better the second time around, so everyone should get two copies. <laughs> um, I had to read the Hazelwood um, very quickly because I, I was had I had to get a copy and like figure out how to get a copy, which was very difficult. I finally convinced my friend Kelly Link to give up her copy. Um, <laughs> But before that, I'm pretty sure that someone sent me a copy and that it went to a secondary party, but never came to me. No, really, like, they were like, and then we'll send it on to you. And I waited and waited. Yeah. So it's not just I who love the Hazelwood, but many, uh, many others who have uh, absconded copies that were rightfully mine. Um, would you like to ask me a question? Oh, sure. Just because I'm so excited. <laughs> um, okay, so I know that we're here celebrating the launch of Hazelwood, but I just need to talk a little bit about how much I love the Cruel Prince. It's just this beautiful vision of fairyland that also brings in like these wonderful elements of the real world, which is my jam, which um, whether you've read the book or not, you will learn that that is exactly my, my kind of literary poison. Um, so I just wanted to talk about this, this vision of fairyland that you create. It's both like enchantingly beautiful and incredibly cruel, and you never let readers kind of forget how ugly things are below the magic of, of a fairy. Um, so can you talk a little bit about why both sides are so crucial to portrayals of the fae? Well, I think there's, um, there's three kind of big things that I think of when you say that. Um, one is that, you know, the folklore itself, fairies are not particularly nice. They're, um, you know, sometimes you'll hear them called like the little people or the people of peace. Um, and that's because um, nobody wanted to say the word fairies because that would make them come over and then they would like mess up all your stuff. So you wanted to be like, yes, the good neighbors. <laughs> They're great. Please don't come here. Don't, you know, steal my, you know, poison my cattle, steal my kid, like, you know, have me come home and find out that my wife is now a, ma a magic piece of wood. <laughs> like, this is the worst. Um, and so in the folklore, they, uh, they have that aspect. That's part of, to me, what drew me to them, what drew me to reading the old folk tales and, and were about fairies. Secondly, I think that whenever you're writing about fairies, you're writing against you know, what people's idea of them may, is sometimes. You know, I, I just had an event, gave a talk with Tony Dirlizzi, who I did the Spiderwork Chronicles with, and a woman came up to us and she was like, you know, my daughter, she's read the Spiderwork books and she's read, um, these other books that have, you know, real fairies in them. <laughs> and to her mind, what real fairies were, were, you know, there were pretty girls who sparkled and had wings. And for a lot of people, that's their idea of fairies. And you're always writing against that. And so you really have to make sure that people from the beginning know this is not that. This is and the third reason is just that when you have all of this magic and all of this beauty, it has to have a price. And in fairy, that price is that dark underbelly that that um, that takes as much as it gives and maybe much much more. You know the idea of a fairy being like a food that's so good that it ruins your ability to taste all other food is kind of definitively how I think of it. Well, I have okay. I have a related question, <laughs> which is that um, just that the hazelwood has this beautiful juxtaposition of the modern day um, with fairy tales, and you were talking about how much you really love that. And getting that effect seems to be all about exact right language, like the exact right piece of modern business right up against um, the exact right piece of fairy tale business added to the difficulty was that you were coming up with fairy tale characters, fairy tale objects that had that were new, they were invented, and had, therefore, to give the feel 
feeling of the, like, had some of the resonance of fairy tale things that we find familiar, but were totally strange. So my question is, like, how did you choose names like Twice Killed Catherine or the Trinity of Images that were like the feather and the bone and the comb? Like, was it, did you have to, did you have to keep messing with them or were they things that just came to you and they were right? Yeah. So I feel like, um, I feel like you have a real BS detector when you're reading fantasy where if something doesn't seem real within like even the logic of an adventure story that like, you can tell immediately. Like when you're reading J.K. Rowling, like you know Hogwarts exists, you know Green Gaps exists. Like those words are just right and they seem real. Um, so I think it's, it's definitely more of a, like get it kind of, yeah, it's like an instinct for getting it right out of the gate because you think about it. It's like when you're trying to name a character whose name is John, and you're like, a last name, and you're like, John Johnson, like John Jonathan. <laughs> and nothing sounds right, it all sounds fake in your mind. So I think the same thing with like naming magical objects and spells and places. It's like that, it just needs to like have that click to it, I guess. So read. How did you do it? <laughs> Um, one thing in my book, it kind of centers around this book of dark fairy tales, and there's 12 and all, and I, I wrote the 12 names down, and this kind of originated in a game my husband and I were playing one night, um, where we were, we were working our way through old Twilight Zone episodes, and we would look on Amazon, and, and, we were, you know, we would look at them, only for videos, nothing else, um, to see the different names of Twilight Zone episodes, and then we were kind of like trying to make up our own, like what would an intriguing Twilight Zone episode title be? So when I wrote these tales, I was like, I wanted each tale to feel like an intriguing Twilight Zone episode you want to watch, like just from reading the title. That's how. <laughs> <laughs> Not real hard. I <laughs> you are widely considered to be the queen of, the fairy queen of fantasy literature. Um, what for you was the original source, books or otherwise, of your fascination with fairy? And like, if you want to go way, way back to when you were a kid or whenever, kind of triggered that for you. The book I owe my career basically to is Brian Fred and Alan Lee's illustrated book Fairies. I, I had it when I was a kid. My mom was a painter so she had it. It wasn't my book. Um, it was her book and um, I don't know if you've ever seen it. If you haven't, I'm sure it's here in this store. You should absolutely go look at it. Um, Brian Proud did concept art for um, films like The Dark Crystal and Labyrinth. Alan Lee did concept art for Lord of the Rings. So imagine them together and coming up with really pretty creepy um, fairies and also the folklore. And it just, it scared me and it also sort of set me off reading, uh, reading more. I actually have a story about that book. Yeah. I got it out of the library when I was a kid um, and I was flipping through it and I found a snapshot like a little three by five snapshot of like a wooded area, like a magical looking wooded area. <gasps> and a I, snapshot in the was, book? Yes. Like somebody like had someone, checked. Like someone had checked the book out and like used it as a bookmark. And I think there were fairies in it, but like, I, I like see it. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> there was like something enchanted about this photo, but I still have it. So oh, I should nice. okay. Yeah, it was such a great find, like a perfect book to find it in. Another favorite of mine is the juniper tree. Mm. And whether or not it, I, I kind of, thought of the shape of the juniper tree when I was writing the backstory, or thinking of the backstory for Finch, mm -hmm. who is a secondary character in the Hazelwood. So I kind of wanted to give his cast a little bit of the juniper tree shape. Mm -hmm. And the juniper tree is um, a boy who is murdered by his stepmother um, in a fit of madness. And then she cooks him into a stew, and his father eats him. And he becomes a bird <laughs> and drops a millstone on her head. Um, <laughs> great story. <laughs> <laughs> it has this wonderful fairy tale rhyme in it, which goes, um, my mother, she killed me, my father, he ate me, my sister, she buried my bones. And again, that is something I ripped on in the Hazelwood as well. So this little piece of my favorite tales I stuck in there. Um, it's, funny, it's funny when I, you know, I retold fairy tales sometimes in public, and it's really funny <coughs> when, you, when you actually say what happens out loud. Yeah. Like, wait. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, so I always love to ask authors about their juvenilia. Um, so if you could tell us a little bit about the earliest stories you wrote. I love talking about my juvenilia, it's yeah. terrible. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, probably my finest piece of juvenilia is a book called uh, Knights of the Silver Sun, by which I believe I meant the moon. <laughs> <laughs> which was... <laughs> 
pastiche of things I loved at the time. So, Lord of the Rings and Interview with the Vampire. <laughs> and it is about a group of adventurers who like went around trying to break out vampires who had been taken by the evil dragon Venthromax. <laughs> and Maine that I thought was so great, I actually gave it to one of our cats. <laughs> I don't know, I mean, you know when just the right <laughs> thing is the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> I thought really hard yeah. and then I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I actually read some of this. Uh, there was a juvenile panel I was on and um, my story was voted second worst. <laughs> I was beat by Scott Westerfeld, no. <laughs> who read from a story of his about a demon in space who solved crimes. <laughs> <laughs> but mine was mine was definitely worse. I feel like he I was robbed. Um, and afterward, a woman came up to us and she said, "You know, my daughter. She's a writer. She's a young writer, and she's pretty good. She's better than you guys were." <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. So will you tell us, I mean, I know that we're going back and forth, but you have to tell us about your journey. Okay, um, so my earliest stories, I'm like already, I'm like, yeah. um, my earliest stories were all about scary pets. I think I went to a scary, <laughs> like how scary? A scary petting zoo. So it's all about um, getting attacked in the woods by other goats or peacocks. <laughs> and then I kind of went to my mom. And then I had a two-year-old adventure novels, Aww. and I had a really tricky one called The Carnival, and it was like there's a scene where like you end up in a theater, and when you look out, the whole audience is made up of like monkeys with your face or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's very inspired by like mid-century madness, I think, even as a seven-year-old or whatever. Um, yeah, and a lot of Bruce Coville fan fiction. Aww. Yeah, and Magic Shop inspired works. Well, despite both of us writing about teenage characters, we both, um, we actually both started out with a scene of young childhood, excuse me, and young childhood sort of trauma. And I was curious, like, how you came to that, what made you decide this is the first scene, rather than a scene that is a flashback that happens later, but starting immediately with, you know, a child character. Um, so my, my heroine Alice is um, 17 at the start of the book, but at the beginning she kind of relays that when she was very young, when she was six years old, she was kidnapped um, by a red-headed man in a blue Buick. And she kind of relays the story and nothing bad, bad, bad happened to her. She was returned to her mother within a day. And I think for me it was just as much about the facts of the story, which will become important later, mm -hmm. um, as the way that she tells it. So she's someone who has had a life kind of marked by bad luck that turns out to be supernatural in origins. And I kind of wanted to express early on that she's a character whose meter for weird is very off. Mm. So the way that she kind of talks about, like, oh, there's this thing that I was kidnapped, I, I thought that kind of showed that she she doesn't realize that the conditions of her life are as odd as they are. Like, maybe she doesn't really, maybe she's a little too casual. Like, her, her life has been marked by such weirdness that the, the, her, her understanding is a little bit skewed. Definitely her, her calm acceptance of it yeah. sort of sets you up for your... Uh, it's one of those those things where like when a character is really upset, sometimes you're like, it's okay, it's gonna be okay. But sometimes when they're like, no, I'm fine, you're like, you're not fine. <laughs> yeah, like the weird person in the laundromat who starts talking to you. Yeah. And, like, yeah. no, it's TMI, and they're like, I'm doing really well. <laughs> <laughs> so your heroine, Jude, she is an orphan human who was raised in Fairyland. And um, she kind of lives life in a constant state of siege because although you can kind of work around fairy rules, you can never be more powerful than them. Um, so what drew you to writing kind of a character who seems seems powerless in this world that she that she kind of will never truly belong to, like this underdog kind of role? I think it's fun. To, I mean, I think it's fun to write um, have a protagonist that has a limited set of. Um, options and abilities, it, it, you know, it forces you into a series of decisions that I think are interesting. But my idea for the book came from sort of this reverse changeling story of these three kids, um, two twins, and then um, an older girl. And so one of the twins' name is Jude, and that's, that's our protagonist. She's an old, they have an older sister. They're growing up in the human world. Their older sister has kind of pointy ears, a little furred, kind of cat eyes. But you know, she's a kid. She's like, yeah, it's normal to me. Um, <laughs> 
And one day, a weird guy comes to their door, gets into an argument with their mother, it becomes clear over the course of the argument that he believes that this woman is his wife and that their older sister is his heir, and that he's real mad that she ran off and he's not really too happy that she has other kids. Um, and he winds up getting into a fight, a physical fight with their father who comes in from the back holding a sword. Which is not weird because he's a blacksmith, like, but he's kind of like a forged in fire kind of blacksmith. So he's just making like, he's always talking to his friends about like material cultures and stuff. He doesn't really swing them around and, except now that he does. And in a few minutes, this guy has killed both her parents. And then is like looking around like, well, that happened fast and maybe I made some bad decisions. <laughs> But now he, and now he has these three kids and then carts them back to Ferry. You know, not knowing what else to do. They're his wife's children, so he decides they're his responsibility. And that was the origin point. To me, that was like the thing I knew because I liked the idea that, I liked the idea of somebody who had had such, and says, you know, much like what you were talking about, such like terrible stuff that had happened and had lived in a state of fear for so long that she actually was uncomfortable not being in that state. And was really good at living in that kind of, at that high, you know, that heightened level of tension yeah. and fear. And then the tension breaks, and it's so awesome. Is there, um, like, is there like a majestic desk? <laughs> There's like a purple lap desk that I got free at a work giveaway. Um, so yeah. <laughs> um, I, We'll, I'll read a little bit. I like to like read as like an honor after writing. Mm -hmm. um, I know some people can't read while they write, but I, mm -hmm. I would be sad. If that so you're sitting like you. in a majestic chair. I'm sitting in a majestic IKEA armchair. Okay, yeah, majestic <laughs> IKEA armchair, purple, purple thing on your lap, candle I'm lit, lit I'm white noise. Tea on the radiator. Uh -huh. White noise. Um, so that was how the hazel was written. And do you write for <laughs> long stretches of time? I don't. I, I would say rarely more than two hours. Yeah, maybe two and a half. Um, I like to write on weekends and evenings, and then now my process is more like writing after 7 p.m. when my when my kids sleeping. Yeah. How about you? And just gonna bounce it if you don't mind. I actually I write a lot with um, with friends. So I um, I uh, live up in Amherst, Massachusetts, and so I go over to my friend Cassie Claire's house and um, us and, and a couple of other people. Um, Kelly Link often is there, and we just sit around and and write it. Kelly and I both have kids at home. Well, Kelly and I both have kids at home, so we're, you know, we're hiding out. Um, and so, yeah, we go there, and, and it's good. We put on our headphones. We don't really, like, we're there, but we don't necessarily talk to each other, except, you know, it, you know if somebody wants to ask a question or talk about something. Um, before that, we were doing, we were going out and doing coffee shop stuff. We would meet at a coffee shop and write for a few hours, and then I come home and write at home, too. So you write for long stretches. I... <laughs> Should <laughs> I, I like I am somebody who like I I I've now I've started doing um sprints where I'll like set a timer and write for that amount of time because otherwise what you free write fast I write during that <laughs> amount of time <laughs> I'm a fiddler I can't stop fiddling with a sentence or with a paragraph and so anything that forces forward momentum is good for me because I can fiddle with one paragraph for all day. So I try to do word counts and I try to do like, I try to do anything to not have the process that I have. <laughs> if you wait for teens, I'd love to know what were you like as a teen yourself? Wow. <laughs> I mean, I, was, I have a lot of eyeliner on. Like a, lot, <laughs> a lot of eyeliner and uh, I was, so I'm, I am, although possibly I don't always present that way, somewhat socially anxious, and so I really had like a lot of hair covering my head, and I was very shy and in black clothes with many pewter dragon necklaces. <laughs> so if you could imagine me, that like exactly what you would imagine that I was like. I was exactly like that. <laughs> yeah, like fully my room had, yes, many. Just the way you would like. Whatever you're picturing, that's right. <laughs> I've written some standalones, and they're not, you know, they're somewhat unusual with fantasy, but it seems that perhaps you've written a standalone. So I was curious, A, what made you decide, right, what made you decide standalone? Two, did you decide standalone? <laughs>
out as a standalone, and we sold it in October of 2016. And I guess, why standalone? Um, I just, I've had so many experiences where I'll be reading a book and reading a book, and I'm like, up till two in the morning, so I just have to finish it. And then I get to the end, and I'm like, it's a series, like I didn't even see it coming. Mm -hmm. um, so there's something so satisfying about a book that you can just like, go down in one sitting, and you don't have to like, wait years for the next one. <laughs> um, so that definitely, I wanted a book that could be read in one sitting with like, total satisfaction. Um, which is the Hazelwood. <laughs> I, I started like jotting down ideas for what a book two might look like, and I kind of was playing with that. Um, so I, I just was kind of playing with it. I just felt like I wasn't done with the world. And then um, not too long ago, my wonderful editor um, and I decided that there will be a second book. So. Um, Well, it's from the Hindu book. That's also going to be This is such good news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, so it inspired, yeah. So very, yeah, I also, I'm a huge fan of standalones. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you that I really feel like, I feel like my favorite books are standalones. Because it's true, you have that full satisfaction. But a standalone with a sequel... Is, yes, it's double, yeah. It's double. That's a standalone. Can you tell us anything about it? I know, not, like, this is totally not supposed to be asking you this, but it's fun. Like, maybe I No? Not yet, no. But thank you for asking. <laughs> so, yeah, what I didn't say is that you would ask us questions, but um, probably should have told you guys that. Yeah, um, so when I was a kid, I would read Peter Pan, like, once or twice a year. Um, I know they don't go through a door, they go through a nursery window, but I love, love, love that book. Um, I love that the journey to the magical land isn't like instantaneous, it's kind of like, you think the Disney movie, you think it's like this very fast, wonderful second start of the right, but when you read the book and like the second start of the right thing is BS, Peter just like made it up off the top of his head. It's just like this long, long flight to Neverland and he forgets about them on the way. And like he like dives down and like comes up covered in mermaid scales and like dives up and comes down laughing about like something a star told him. And it's just like these three kids in nightgowns who are like freezing. And they're just like dying. They're not even Worst children. idea. <laughs> um, so it's just like, it's kind of a microcosm of a whole wonderful book where it's like magic has a cost. Mm -hmm. And magic is heartless. And like Peter Pan is heartless. And I, I just so responded to that as a kid that um, that, that heartlessness is uh, one of the coolest things in fantasy. Like especially a kid's book that can like remind you of cruelty. <laughs> 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 so Holly, I, well first I love both the books. I, I got, I got Hazelwood on NetGalley and finished it in a day and Thank then you. was like tweeting sad crying gifts. <laughs> but, um, Cruel Prince blew my mind. I loved it so much and I loved getting to see characters that I already fell in love with and while I was reading I almost feel like if there's a spectrum with K on one end and Jude on the other, and then Hazel's just like smack in the middle. Was that, I mean, is that just me being nuts, or was that something like was intentionally there, or you were just like, oh, hey, that's cool. Huh, that's really interesting. Yeah. I never would have occurred to me to sort yeah. of put yeah. them, but I can see okay. what you mean. And now there. you're going to tell people that you did it on purpose. <laughs> absolutely intentional. But I think for me, what was really interesting was having you know, Can Robin and, and, you know, and characters from Darkest Part of the Forest show up in the book and have them not necessarily be on the same page. Like, have them, they all want stuff, and there's ways in which they want sort of similar stuff, but ways in which they really, really don't. And um, because it's a trilogy, that gets to play out more over, over the next two books. Like, they're actually people who, you know, who have political positions who may not, you know, who may or may not be allies with Jude for the whole time. Awesome. You both have gorgeous covers, and this is your debut novel. Did you have any say? I didn't, luckily. <laughs> um, I have no talent in visuals, but I was like gobsmacked by the beauty of the covers and extra by the foil. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so beautiful. Yeah, I feel very lucky, and I love it. Um, so, you know, I have. Luckily, like, I, you know, people have been really great. Little Brown, really great. My editor, Elena, hello. <laughs> been super great about involving me in the process. And I think that that's, that's wonderful. However, I will admit, I had a stupid idea for the cover that took us in a terrible direction. <laughs> and this, I had nothing to do with. It is much better than my stupid idea. <laughs> the face of it, stupid, which is, um, I had, a, like, a sort of idea about a, a throne. And, you know, um, I think I had some 
ideas about like it would be stone and it would have these things, but it didn't. Underground? It's gonna, yeah. <laughs> I don't think it sounds, on the face of it, like it could be terrible. I mean, it could, I mean, it, well, yeah. <laughs> it didn't come out right. Anyway. Um, his favorite book is The Gruffalo, which is about a monster with Natalie Muse, and he's a Gruffalo. He's great. Um, he also loves Some Bugs, which is a book about oh. some bugs. <laughs> um, yeah, he, so his, his evolution of loving books has been like, first he just didn't care and I read them for me because I was on maternity leave, you know, like I gotta read something. Um, and then he started being entranced by the images, like the covers blew his mind. And now he just wants to like grab them and kick them and like kind of turn the pages. Mm -hmm. Like he's a genius, he's, he's kind of turning them. Um, <laughs> and eventually one day he'll, he'll love the stories, I hope. And yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, it feels like intimidating, it's so ridiculous. It feels intimidating, the idea of making up a story to a baby, why does it seem intimidating? Um, <laughs> those kids are such harsh judges. Like, if they don't like it, they'll be like, meh. Nah. Yeah. Um, I, I would love to do that. How about you? With your oh, you'll have to do it. Yeah. Yeah, no, there's definitely a, like, now tell me a story about me and you, and we're going to, we're going to fight ghosts. Um, and ride uniforms, and you're like, and all that in one story, and he's like, yes. <laughs> all right. Yeah, or like, tell me, we're gonna go to the moon, and we're gonna bring the cat. So it's you know, yeah. <laughs> or to so, tell me Anansi stories, Anansi the spider. So I looked up two Anansi stories, right? Because they're doing a middle school. And then he was like, no, 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 now I want you to make up one. <laughs> I made up two, and they were not that bad. And then he was like, another one, and I was like, back to the internet. I don't know. <laughs> that was a story in me. <laughs> it was like the, pr the pressure. It was pressuring. <laughs> this is for Holly. Um, I was... I'm Irish, and one thing Irish kids always learn is don't mess with the fairies because they will hurt you. <laughs> and I was wondering, did Irish mythology play any role in this book? Because I really sort of connected to that. I mean, absolutely. Like, um, a lot of Celtic <laughs> mythology, Irish and, and also Scottish, um, and trying to um, sort of find commonalities in, in you know, in folktales. But absolutely. Um, so... <laughs> And like, and also like, I read a lot of old stories. Like, there's this book called Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries, um, which is W. Y. Evans Wentz, and he goes around and he he goes, you know, specifically to Ireland and also to Scotland and England, and takes down people's stories of the real stuff that happened to them. And this is, you know, it is exactly what you're talking about. People being like, don't mess with the fairies. And what I really love about fairy stories is that, like ghost stories, they're often about like the moment that the supernatural bumps up against the regular and then kind of goes away and um like one of my favorite stories is this guy he's gonna build a uh, he's gonna build a house he gets married he's gonna build a house you know he um picks out some property he doesn't consult with anybody who might know stuff about whether or not this property was um property he should be building on or not builds his house moves his wife in and then the first night they're there the whole house is shaking even though there's nothing nearby. And so belatedly, he goes to a fairy expert, and he's like, um, so if theoretically someone had built a house, not me, <laughs> on this stretch of land, what would you say? And the fairy expert um, is like, well, you know, good news, bad news. You know, you built your house on fairy, a fairy path, and fairies, they don't like to go around things. But good news, it was only a corner of your house. And so he cuts off the corner of his house, and in this, this is actually, this is a book from, uh, this is actually a story from the Middle Kingdom, um, which is Dermot McCannis, and um, there's a picture of the house with the corner cut off. And then, ever, ever since, everything's fine. You go back to normal life, except some nights they, he they hear a strong wind that takes the corner. It's like, sad as to me, like, what I love about the stories. Wait, this is a book where people are these stories? Someone yeah, these yeah, there's a bunch of, yeah, there's a bunch of really, um, these, these accounts of people who went out, these folklorists who went out and got these first, and you know, these first person accounts, and then sometimes second person accounts, like my grandfather always told me this story. So when you were in your juvenile writing phase and all that stuff, what magical world did you try to emulate the most, and what magical creature were, was the most fascinating to you? Both of you. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I love dragons a whole lot. 
Um, but I think the writer that I most tried to emulate was a British fantasy writer called Tanith Lee, who's, um, who I super, super love, who wrote really ornate and kind of emotion, like like kind of emotionally removed <coughs> prose, and um, and did actually retell a bunch of fairy tales in the sort of Angela Carver manner, and um, God, I like I wanted to write like Tanith Lee, but I of course couldn't. So there's a lot of bad Tanith Lee bestations <laughs> in my life. For me, mermaids. I was obsessed with mermaids. I still do. Um, I even read this book called The Water Babies because I thought it might be about mermaids, and it was like an allegory. <laughs> very, very misleading cover. Um, yes, mermaids are my like creature of choice, and I, uh, I definitely, you know, Bruce Coville. Tried to emulate Bruce Coville. I wanted to write like, oh, when I was a little older, Francesca Lee of Lock. Yes. Um, everyone's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hi, hi, hi. Yeah. 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 Y